hopefully everybody's got what they need um, and you're ready to, to get into uh, get into some more wonderful talks. Um, so hopefully Winona, do we have Winona nearby? Are you, uh, are you close? Um, Hi. There, there she is. All right. Very good. Um, so here we, we made a little uh, title slide for you. So here, ready? I, I believe so. I'm going to just make sure I can load my PowerPoint up. All right. So Winona LaDuke. Um, she's loading up her PowerPoint. Uh, we're, we're very excited. Lots of, lots of folks, even uh, Chief Vincent Mann was super stoked. Uh, hopefully he's still here, tuned in, listening. Um, but yeah, but I need to make sure it's the right one, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm talking to my friend here who's helping me. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually ready whenever you are. And yeah, uh, great. I'm just making sure I was technically being astute and such, you know? Perfect. All right. Well, so uh, we're we're honored and glad you're here, and uh, we'll let you take the digital stage. Thank you, Miigwech. Anin, uh, hello, my relatives. Anin Nindawe Mugganantuk, Benisi Kwan, Jinakas, Makwandodim. I'm Bear Clan from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota, and I'm a farmer, and I'm really happy to be here with you. And, um, you know, I was at this conference or a virtual meeting here with the Kellogg Foundation a few days ago, and there was all these people talking about how they felt. They had one day, one word they could we're all given one word to say how we felt and uh everybody was like nervous uh stressed um anxious and then they come to me and i said i'm excited i'm excited because spring's coming i looked at my seed catalogs and i'm ready because when you plant and you put your prayers out you're making you're you're planting seeds of hope and you're making the future so that's what i'm gonna talk about I'm gonna talk a little bit about my community here and uh, what we're doing. And I'm really happy to be here with you because uh, we're all gonna grow the future. Okay, now let us pray my PowerPoint actually appears in a good way. Now see, it's not on the first one, so just a second here. Aha. And then we go this, can you see this now? Can someone give me like a, I got you, LaDuke. Beautiful, we got Perfect. it. Perfect, okay. So this is um, a Indian woman. This is a water protector, I'm a water protector. And um, this woman is not missing and murdered. She's very present. She's not invisible as native people are largely made invisible uh, or erased from history. But this woman is about 20 feet, I think 30 feet wide and 40 feet tall. I should go measure one day, but I see her. She's a mural in downtown Duluth on Second Street and Second Avenue, the Mary American Indian Culture uh, Community Health Organization. So I just wanna say, this is a little bit of art from my territory. There's some more art from my territory. This is um, uh, art by Norval Morriso and it's called Relatives. We are all related. And I just wanna talk about that because I'm gonna talk about farming, but you know, basically in an Anishinaabe worldview, which is an indigenous holistic worldview, which a lot of the world seems to be coming to, whether they talk about things like permaculture or you know, beneficial insects, we're on that team of understanding that we're all relatives and some of our relatives have wings and some have fins and have some have hands and some have paws and some have roots we're relatives and you could see like in a lot of our art there's spirit lines that connect the beings um, and the beings and the spirit of the beings to the other beings and so I just want to say that uh, in the indigenous worldview you know the world is different than perhaps the western worldview I'm just going to say that but you know even that like this is a new year in the Gregorian calendar and the Ojibwe New Year starts really in March with Ona Bonagesis, which is the hard crested snow moon. And then it's followed by the moon um, known as Iskigami Zikigisis, the maple syruping moon, which I believe you all understand that. that to the Anishinaabe people is the new year when the forest wakes up and the water wakes up and life wakes up from the long sleep of winter. And I think, uh, you know, I mean, in, in our calendar, we have Ona Banagizis, hard crusted snow moon. Uh, Iskigami Zikigizis, that'd be the maple syruping moon. Then we have um, Wabagan Amizis, that's the flower moon. Uh, Odeiman Agizis, strawberry moon. Mean Gizis, that's the blueberry moon. Menominee Gizis, the wild rice making moon. Now, I believe that the people here who farm understand that way of thinking. You're observing your calendars based on the land. And, um, you know, if I told you all our moons in Anishinaabe, our language, which is related to Vincent Mann, we're cousins, me and Vincent. Um, we, uh, you know, 
you'll notice that there's not a single uh, month that's named after a Roman emperor. And uh, so it is possible to say that, um, that uh, em you know, empire is not necessary in a worldview. And I just want you to think about that a little bit because that's this moment where we're kind of deconstructing empire. And that's what we got to do if we're going to survive. And I think everyone who's here at this conference pretty much knows that, that you know, now is the time. I, I like um, in our teachings as Anishinaabe, we're told that we have a choice between two paths in this time. It's called the time of the seventh fire. And as Anishinaabe people were told we had a choice between two paths, one well-worn and scorched and the other green. And it would be our choice upon which path to embark. I pretty much think that's where we all are. Even the United Nations says that for the world to survive, capitalism has to die. We have to transform systems dramatically. And really my feeling is no time like the present. You know, Aaron Dottie Roy talks about pandemic as portal, you know, says in the history of the world, pandemics have forced societies to change. That's the way it is. You know, worlds change when you have a pandemic because you realize the smartest white men are, they ain't in charge. And, uh, you know, so in that time, you, you start just as we have. You notice what doesn't work. Oh, your food system. You notice that supply chains in China don't work so good. You notice that, like, it is one crisis after another with climate change that comes upon us. And then you have to change how you are and how you live. And, um, you know, that is why I'm excited, because this is, this is what my ancestors spoke of. And my dad spoke of many times. He always told, talked about this time when there wouldn't be food in the store. And I thought, you know, when I was a young woman, I couldn't really fathom that, but I just saw that, you know? So that's why it is great to be a farmer and be with all you. But before you're a farmer, you gotta be in honor of the earth, you know? And I say that because, uh, you know, on a worldwide scale, you gotta protect the wild. And I think that those of us who are here working on agrobiodiversity also know that we absolutely have to protect the biodiversity that exists in the world because that is where life is. That's where the wild things are. That's where life is. You know, in, in recent gatherings of the learned white men, uh, they've said that you have to save 50% of the world for the wild. And of course, we humans, being pretty much the T-Rexes of the, of the present era, have consumed more than half the world's you know, biosphere. We're chomping away, chomping away, chomping away with our stuff. And uh, so where there are, is wild still is where there are indigenous people. You know, and, and we are some of those people here in northern Minnesota on the White Earth Reservation. I'm, I'm here up in my, in my house on Round Lake in the middle of the reservation, place where my great, 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 greats lived. And uh, but on a worldwide scale, turns out that indigenous people are about 4% of the world's population, but 75% of the world's biodiversity. And uh, so if you want to protect the rainforest or the boreal forest or the rivers or the wild rice, you got, it is us, you know. This is our territories. I'm this square up in northern Minnesota. That's where I'm, I'm from. And I know that you know most of you have had an American education, so you have no idea where most Indian reservations are, except for not near you. But here's some uh, tribal jurisdictions. It doesn't have treaty territories, but I'm one of the seven big Ojibwe reservations in northern Minnesota. Anishinaabe Aking, Aking. Aking, that's our word for land. But it means, really, it means the land to which the people belong. It doesn't mean Minnesota means a king, inda king amin, the very land to which we belong, the very land to which we belong, a king. You know, I want you to think about that and then in a language itself, like I were for old man, old dude, akwenzi, akwenzi, he who comes from the earth, he comes from the earth. You know, so I just want to say, be close to the earth, be close to the biodiversity that's there. This is a, a painting by Rabbit Strickland of our old ones, this is a mythological beings, Nana Buju and uh, Nokomis, and uh, they are out uh, going through the wild rice. That's what they're doing, you know, harvesting wild rice. And I'm telling you this because I live in the place where the only place in the world where wild rice grows, it's the wild rice bowl. It's the only grain indigenous to North America. And all you gotta do is take care of your rice and, and uh, oops, sorry, I'm kind of going backwards here. Take care of your rice and it will stay for thousands of years. Take care of your lakes, take care of your water quality. And you go out there with two sticks and a canoe, like this, they, these old ones have. And, and in front, you see his, his grandmother is harvesting the wild rice. You pull it down and you knock it into your canoe like this. That's what you do. And uh, you collect thousands of pounds like that. And uh, so that's where I live, the place where the wild things are. 
But, uh, you know, I want to talk about making America great again. Um, this is when America was great, is when there was tremendous biodiversity and agrobiodiversity. 10,000 varieties of corn, you know, originating in North America. And none of those varieties needed Monsanto or Syngenta. They didn't need them. They were made by indigenous people, people who looked a lot like me, who selected seeds and, and were able to create these, uh, you know, corn varieties at 10,000 from the pink corn to the blue corn, to the popcorn, to the flower corn, to the sweet corn, good stuff, good stuff. But, you know, we not only did that, but, you know, back in the day when America was great, you had 50 million buffalo. And those buffalo lived in the Great Plains territory. That's the largest biome in North America. And, and the buffalo that existed on this continent were the single largest migratory herd in the world. Let me say that one more time. The North American buffalo herd represented the single largest migratory herd in the world. And uh, destruction of the buffalo herd destroyed ecosystems. Because those buffalo, oh, I wish I showed you a picture of buffalo in the minus 40 degrees. They live in the winter. They're all decked out for it, you know? And they don't need uh, to be fed. They, they got these heads that go like this down in the snow to go get their, their perennial grasses. There used to be 250 different species of grass on the plains. And, 50 million buffalo to eat them. And you didn't have to have a feedlot, you didn't have to take care of them, you just went out and hunted. That was indigenous thinking, perennialized agriculture, perennialized you know, systems. And, and uh, you know, so I just wanna say, America was great when there was, the skies were black with passenger pigeons, when you could drink the water from every stream and river, when there was fish in such abundance that you could, you could almost say, say, walk across the river with the fish that were there. And, uh, us in America was great, you know? And uh, some of it's still pretty great. This is uh, Rice Lake up on my reservation. Myself and Don Goodwin, another water protector sister who was arrested this year with me. Um, actually, I think she was arrested in a different incident, but that's, uh, well, that's what wild rice looks like. That's not a pasture, that's a wild rice bed on Rice Lake and you're gonna go out there with two sticks in a canoe and harvest that rice and bring it in and parch it and, and uh, over a fire. And then you're gonna uh, use it. You're gonna let it cool and use a fanning mill. And then we're going to, uh, um, you're going to dance on it. You know, that's what you do, but now you use a different equipment, but it's all intermediate technology. And most of it is very specialized technology developed by Anishinaabe people. So that's the good life. And then there's this life, you know? And now if you don't know who these two characters are on the, on, on the left side is Sitting Bull and on the right side is Custer. And, you know, in many ways it is so emblematic what it is we got here in this image is really, I think what, you know, kind of colonialism looks like from Manifest Destiny to Monsanto. You know, it's this entitled, privileged idea that we know what's best and we're going to shove it down your throats and we're going to kill you so we could actualize it. Welcome to America. Um, so that conflict, a conflict's old. Y'all don't need a lecture on that one. And the questions are, uh, you know, the legacy that we live in today is a continuation of this conflict between two worldviews. I'm just going to humbly suggest that the indigenous worldview has more resilience than the American worldview. I must suggest that we, we hung out longer. All right, so look, this is what it looked like this summer. I have just spent eight years fighting the single largest tar sands pipeline in North America, didn't win. Shoved this baby through Enbridge, Canadian multinational, Canadian multinational, which is where all the tar sands oils come from and all the pipelines come from is from Canada could export a health policy, but no, they just want to export dirty tar sands. And they shove these tar sands oil pipelines through our, our territory. You know, they, they busted three aquifers. They, they had frack outs on 28 rivers. They cut a swath of destruction through the North and violated our civil rights. The police of Minnesota were paid by the Enbridge Corporation. I'm just saying that in the wisdom of Minnesota, the costs incurred with putting in a pipeline should be paid by the multinational corporation putting in the pipeline. Because after all, at DAPL, Dakota Access and Standing Rock, there they had uh, 
38 million dollars with the military costs. Minnesota, you know, I think the estimates right now are around 5 million to shove their pipeline down our throats. But the problem is, is that the police were all paid for by Ambridge. And so the police build every hour, every minute, every uh, cappuccino, mocha at Starbucks that they had to have so that they could beat up protesters and water protectors like myself. And, and uh, they did that all and it was paid for by Ambridge. And uh, you know, the problem is, is that foreign multinationals should not pay for your police. I just wanna say Canadian multinationals in many countries in Latin America are charged with human rights violations for militarizing and oppression of indigenous people. Not any different here. Thousand people were arrested, thousand people. This is actually <coughs> my arrest photo. One of them, most epic looking. Uh, and those are my, that's my family, those kids. And our Horse Nation Academy, you know, <coughs> they weren't arrested, but um, it was a standoff. This is the Shell River. And uh, my tribe appointed me the guardian of the Shell, guardian at litem of the Shell River, because we uh, know that this river has a spirit. And this is where they're putting the drilling under the river and we're trying to stop them. But, um, you know, you can see there's a video of this. It's, kind of, it's a Jackson Brown video. I am a patriot. I'll make sure I share it with you. It was really a great, a great video. But um, this is what it looks like to stand up for your water. And uh, you're going to get some charges. And um, then what you want is the solution. So that's what I'm going to talk about mostly. You know, I'm not going to talk to you about climate change. Uh, looks, looks like it's going down. Looks like catastrophes of biblical proportions <laughs> on all levels. And Enbridge is enabling more with the equivalent of 50 new coal-fired power plants in their, in their tar sands pipeline, put in by a Democratic governor for no reason except for he thinks that Canadians should run our state. It's really a pathetic, a pathetic situation in Minnesota. So for those of us who are enlightened, we are all ready for the next economy, the just transition. That's why I was excited at this Kellogg meeting I was at. I said, I'm excited because I'm planting seeds and we're preparing for the next economy. You know, we could wait for someone to, to uh, do that for us, but I know I'm old. I think that's unlikely. I think times are the essence and we should just do it ourselves. So I call this the sitting bull plan. You know, some people might refer to this as the Green New Deal or the just transition. I'm gonna just talk about it from kind of my vantage point as a farmer, community organizer on the White Earth Reservation and regionally with indigenous communities, indigenous farmers. And I'm gonna say also that, uh, you know, in this uh, sitting bull, this was a great political leader. And uh, he said many, many things, but one of the things he said is that, you know, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. Let's put our minds together, see what kind of future we can make for our children. And, uh, you know, to me, that's really uh, what this is. This is our opportunity to step up, burn our best, do their best, pray hard, work harder than work a little harder. That's what I think. And, and, and you know, our prophecy said, take the green path. And so that's what I'm doing. So let me talk a little bit about that. Okay, this is my hemp farm. This is two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. All these boys moved in with me because their cool school canceled. And uh, all of a sudden I became a uh, school principal of a school that now has, uh, well, there's really like six 15 year old boys in it. And um, we farm, we farm and, uh, and we use various online, but we mostly have a farming curriculum. This is Winona's Hemp and Heritage Farm. That little girl next to me is my granddaughter, Lillian, and that, that little dude behind me, he's not very little now, up on the car with that, I don't know, kind of hat that has polo or something. That's Guy Wade in Bucanaga, and he's one of my grandsons. Um, so our idea, I started working uh, on farming a long time ago. I... Uh, my father, you know, uh, came to see me when I was an undergraduate at Harvard one time and more than one time, but I remember him saying, Winona, 
you're smart. <laughs> I said it different than that. He said, no, no, you're a smart young woman, but I don't want to hear your philosophy if you can't grow corn. No, I was like, I'm going to grow corn. So I've been growing corn now for 30 years, trying my best to grow corn. And I'm actually a pretty good corn grower. Um, and this is one of our fields. And this is our girl team, or one of them. And this, that's some of our corn. It's, uh, I think that's a man, uh, no, a Mandan variety that was adapted by maybe Dave Christensen out in Montana. That might be a painted mountain variety. Now this field here is in the middle of some agricultural disaster fields of corporate agriculture surrounding us on all sides. And it's the one tribal 80 acre parcel in the middle of about 15,000 acres of industrial agriculture. And so we are there to give it a little love. I'm illustrating that a hoe is a garden implement. <laughs> and uh, we are interested in horse-drawn agriculture and organic agriculture and restoring uh, food systems and growing out traditional varieties. We didn't put our most sacred varieties in this field because of the, every farmer here knows, like because of the risk of contamination. I put the super sacred varieties in not the industrial ag fields. And um, here's us putting in the corn. This is Kara Knowles, my favorite. Uh, and then look at that. That is, uh, that'd be Kermit Minor with, um, he's got a uh, Lolita named after Lolita Lebron. For those of you who are older like me, the Puerto Rican nationalist and Chaga. And uh, they are drawn a horse-drawn manure spreader that is actually not just full of manure, but fish guts that have been ground up. And uh, we're raising heck, we're raising heck in the, in the garden. This is like our first run with a manure spreader. It had some repairs in it. And so uh, I'm just saying we're working on it, but this is our first run and we're pretty proud. It's really fun to say you're spreading shit. That's <laughs> really fun. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. Super fun. And uh, that's what we grow. Now, these aren't our potatoes, but look, you know, I'm interested in agrobiodiversity. And so work we do in our community and I've been doing is the restoration of indigenous varieties of corn, beans, squash, and potatoes, melons, uh, Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes, better called that, and then uh, tobacco, and then now hemp. But this is what agrobiodiversity looks like. Uh, these are potatoes from the Peruvian Potato Museum. Yeah, and the Peruvian Potato Museum, all that biodiversity. And, um, you know, the thing is, it's like this year was bad drought. Well, some of these potatoes did good. The purples did very good in a lot of my fields. I don't know why. And the fingerlings did good, but the Yukon's not so good. And I'm growing um, a lot out of, what's my friend up there uh, in Maine, the potato farmer up there. You know, I'm growing all kind of potatoes, but I'm also working specifically with for purple potatoes uh, from our region. and. Uh, my ancestors grew purple potatoes, so that's what I grow. And I also grow, I grow 17 varieties of potatoes on, on, on our farms. And we're interested in which ones are climate resilient, which pests hit when. And uh, this photo was actually from an article about scientists studying potatoes for climate change and which potatoes are most adaptable in climate change. And they're studying the Peruvian potato collection. So. Agrobiodiversity is really what you want. And uh, indigenous people have a lot of these seeds and our agricultural systems uh, and uh, our, our food and our farms need to be nurtured and we need our seeds to grow. And this is the goat gete okosman, uh, one of them that we grew out and um, like to show this squash. You know, a lot of you, I just saw it in Baker's seed catalog. I was looking at it and I felt like I'd arrived when I was in the whole seed catalog. But this squash here, you know, when I was first given the squash about 10, 11 years ago, I was told that it came from an archeological dig in Green Bay, Wisconsin, near Green Bay, Wisconsin, where they found a clay ball and in the clay ball was these seeds. Uh, shook it, cracked it open. There's these seeds, 800 years old. Then subsequently, a white man corrected me and said it was actually a Miami squash that was a thousand years old. So it's all good. Um, all I know is that it's an old squash seed and it grows really well. It, I have a bunch of them. I would show you my squash unit up here. 
so much squash is up here. And uh, um, I, see, I save them high and dry. And, you know, most of you know that a squash could be, uh, could keep, like a squash like this could keep for months. And that's why I kind of think of it as a low carbon food because you don't have to do anything with it. You just let it hang around and it gets cool. And I mean, it, you know, it hangs around and then you can eat it a month later. Some of these I've eaten like in, I mean, even my spaghetti squashes up here, I could eat them like months later, you know, almost a year later, some of these squash, but don't want to do that. But my point is, it's like, think about what you grow, how you grow it, low carbon, footprint, you know, I know everybody in this, in this uh, webinar is thinking about that. All right. And then think about locally, localizing your food system. You know, I mean, you could add more in here, but I just would say, and I should have had my photo of the Pillsbury Doughboy. I mean, look, I come from Minnesota. Pillsbury Doughboy comes from Minnesota and I feel like they've done such a successful job. We all look like the Pillsbury Doughboy now. And I think uh, that's a bad idea. We should quit wasting food, quit eating so much and uh, get, quit being Wendigos quit being cannibals, just get, 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 get it together here. And quit shipping food around, so get local. You know, but that's why we're having this conversation. And then there's the most exciting part of this conversation, which is the hemp work. Ah, my favorite. I'm wearing a hemp shirt here. See this hemp shirt? This is from uh, Sympatico Design. Chinese hemp, no hemp made in America. But Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills. Wait, let me say that one more time. Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills and the last hemp mill in Minnesota was, thank you, in Winona, Minnesota. I feel that I am destined and I've been working on hemp. So I'm a fiber hemp grower. You know, I'm all for legalization, 100% for legalization, uh, medical, all of that, man, it's food. I'm just really mostly interested in fiber hemp because I'm interested in transforming the materials economy because the materials economy is full of fossil fuels and really toxic. But more than that, because the word canvas comes from cannabis. Wait, one more time. The word canvas comes from cannabis. And so that would mean that you could get rid of a lot of tarps that are plastic. In Minnesota, all those boat covers, you know, all that stuff. You do that, you get, you go back to hemp. So I've been growing for seven years. I have a state of Minnesota permit for fiber hemp and I have a federal permit to grow fiber hemp. That's what I'm interested in doing. And that's what I do. And uh, this is uh, my first field. This is some of my family, that tall kids, my, my, one of my sons and I, oh, kid, guys in the middle, son, nephews, partners. Uh, all right, fiber hemp looks a lot like bamboo cutting this first field out. This was actually a volunteer crop. I say that. Yeah, reseeded itself. You know, we we're just trying to learn, but nice, nice volunteerism there. And um, this here uh, is what we grow. So we've been growing and looking at these varietals and figuring out the best growing conditions. And of course, working on the puzzle, the puzzle that happens after you criminalize marijuana under that. Marijuana Prohibition Act, and you destroy all the evidence. You know, I think about this because uh, they say, who killed the electric car? There's that whole film, you know, and um, it's like with hemp, it's like, who killed the industry and where'd the body go? Because all writing about it has been like pretty much burned. <laughs> However, we proceed and uh, we've just purchased Russian hemp seeds and we are growing out rapidly. Um, but why am I doing that? Because one, I live in the north and they will clear cut the entire north woods to make toilet paper if we don't stop them. Or um, OSB, oriented strand board. Some guys out of North Carolina want to cut the forest down. So what if we just used trees and made hemp wood and instead hemp instead of trees? And um, hemp wood, hemp paper, and then textiles. I mean, this is my hemp shirt, as I said, but you know, we're in an era of fast fashion, probably well over three quarters of the, what's worn today is polyester, fossil fuels. We got some cotton, but cottons, you don't get a tiara for cotton. I mean, it's 4% of the world's agriculture and 25% of all pesticides. 
or agricultural, you know, chemicals. So, you know, what you need is, is the hemp textile economy. And that's really our commitment. And so I have followed every lead. I feel like Alice in Wonderland. I go to hemp conferences. I follow leads of corporations that change ownership and disappear and cannabis money is in them and everybody's gonna make a billion dollars. And I have followed about 75 leads trying to figure out how to process hemp. They process it in China and they process it in Belgium. And um, I'm trying to get it processed in North America. So uh, we're working and people have more suggestions on that, you know, or I've known somebody who's processing for fabric, let me know, or for textiles, you know, and uh, Winona's Hemp, Winona's Hemp at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat, Winona's Hemp at gmail.com. Now, um, but this is just, you know, part of our work here. And uh, we're also interested in hemp for all these other things like insulation or, um, you know, so if 75% of the hemp stock is herd, herd, which is this little stuff in the middle, like the little carb, like the little uh, shredded stuff, that stuff is what you use for hempcrete. And the fiber is what you use basically for textiles, or you can use it for insulation. This is insulation here. This block here is from hemp wool. It's called hemp wool. And I just installed that in a house here or on the south a garage in our in our farm and it was uh, very good very good success and we liked working with it it replaced fiberglass and there's one you know there's a couple manufacturers of this in the country but we would really like to manufacture a product like this because uh, we're in the north and we could grow a lot of hemp and um, also we have a lot of tribal housing which would would do well to be de decoupled from the fossil fuel industry uh, pretty much all of us would be good to be decoupled. And underneath it is a Navajo rug with hemp fiber. We've been working with Navajo rug weavers and uh, Navajo textile artists, and they have been uh, taking our hemp and, and blending it, with weaving it and spinning it with churro sheep wool and coming up with 60, 40, and 40, 60 blends with churro sheep wool and selling their rugs at a market at a much higher price. And this is one of the first uh, rugs with our hemp and their wool. Uh, you know, this is what the future looks like in artisan hemp economy for Ojibwe people and Navajo people working together. And then uh, this is a box that they made um, of hemp wool box that they've just been producing. This is artisan work and, um, you know, just over the top artisan work that, you know, this is part of our, one of our collaborating one of our partners, you know, uh, on the Navajo reservation. Um, uh, we call this the new green revolution. This is my hemp field a couple of years ago. This is my, looks like I'm in the sixties picture. Um, but I really see that hemp could change the world. Uh, John Trudell used to say that, that, you know, could transform the materials economy, could transform the, you know, the fuel economy, the food economy. And, uh, I call it the new green revolution. And I do that because the last green revolution was started in Minnesota by a cat named Norman Borlaug and brought us a lot of uh, GMOs and industrialized agriculture and a lot of fossil fuels. And so I think the new green revolution needs to be born and we're gonna, we're gonna give birth to it here in, in uh, Minnesota. I'm gonna be a doula and a lot of people should be doulas because the next economy, if you're gonna transform the world, you need buddies. Not gonna do it by yourself in a little niche going to make a little one thing by myself. You got you to scale it and you got to work collaboratively because the potential for hemp is hundreds of thousands of acres that bioremediate carbon sink. It's like the fastest carbon sink and uh, could save the world. So I'm in. And then uh, oh, this is one of our, our new green revolution calendars. You can order it from us. Um, Arts by um, Photon, new green revolution. That's us. And then this is my village. I'm gonna just end up by telling a little bit about the rest of our, our work here, but this is my village. It's called Pine Point, kind of a you know war on poverty housing built by the Johnson administration here, 50 years old. But we decided to paint it and put some solar panels on it. And um, you know, basically I feel like that you're gonna make your future, don't wait for someone because you're just gonna be unhappy. And um, you know, in these times we're in, 
you know, I'm going to plant my seeds with hope and prayers. I'm going to sponsor a hemp conference. I'm actually going to teach a hemp class, Hemp 101, uh, get people to understand like a little bit about it. And then uh, I'm going to tell everybody to work hard and pray hard. And, uh, you know, I believe in all this. This is, a, I like this Dr. Emoto. This is uh, prayers to water. And uh, I didn't really know that water crystals were all different, but then it makes sense if you think about it. But you can see the difference in the water crystals that are polluted. And uh, then you can see what happens if you pray with a water crystal. Um, you know, have faith, pray hard, and, and bring life, bring life. That's what farmers can do. And in that process, you know, I believe that, that uh, you know, it is not only how we farm, but it's how we change our legal institutions. Uh, my tribe in 2018 uh, recognized the rights of wild rice, Monoman, the rights of Monoman to exist as an entity. And um, there's a lot of indigenous nations and now settler nations that are adopting the rights of nature. Uh, Aotearoa or New Zealand adopted the rights of nature on a river and uh, on a mountain. And um, this is uh, Evo Morales, temporarily unseated from, from uh, Bolivia, first indigenous president of, of Bolivia, but the Tesla coup, I think that's what you call it when you get taken out by Elon Musk, but he's back, um, instituted the rights of mother earth as a part of their constitution. And uh, that was in 2010, I believe, after Ecuador. So leadership on the new laws, you know, I mean, all those who are on this webinar know that, you know, in this country, the rights of uh, corporations supersede the rights of people. And what we need is the rights of Mother Earth to supersede the rights of corporations, you know, because it's uh, not a good idea to pick a fight with Mother Earth. Not a good idea. So I'm going to not. I'm going to try to do my best. And this is our wild rice. We pray that we still have wild rice because I'm going to garden. But, you know, if 30% of my food is this staple crop, I'm going to protect my ecosystem. That's what I'm going to do from climate change and big oil companies and big mining corporations because, you know, there's money and then there's rice. So we're going to, I'm taking futures and wild rice and hemp and goats and buffalo, squash. And uh, this is our organization that we do the work with on agriculture, Anishinaabe Agriculture Institute. I'm the research director there. But, um, you know, happy to share with you. And um, I'm really happy to join you in this. And uh, I gave my little speech, and I don't know if you got um, some questions, but I'm happy to open up for some questions, Miigwech. Oh, I do, I do see a bunch of questions here. All right, All right here we come. Uh, we're going to start building. So uh, oh, here we readjust. We stood up. So thank you so much. Um, and I, like you said, most of the people here, I'm sure we're on a, a similar page and really truly appreciate and value the, the work and care that not only you're giving to your local land, but also helping to inspire the rest of us to, to care and love for the land that we're, we belong to. Um, you know, I'm a, I love hemp and cannabis. And uh, I think not only just as a, a medicine and a recreation, but fiber. My grandfather uh, was a textile scientist. So as a child, I got to study really close uh, textile patterns. And when I had learned how, not only how strong and how versatile hemp is, it's, it's amazing. Now, from a farmer standpoint, how long, what's the, the growth cycle? What's your, how long do you expect to maturity for your fiber plants? Well, we plant in June after the first frost. Hemp doesn't like its feet wet. So you can't plant it in really like wet fields, but it needs good water and good, uh, it needs good nutrients, you know, cause to grow that tall, that fast, you need, you need some good stuff, right? You know, but also that's how it bioremediates cause it sucks us up, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it sucks up stuff, but, um, you know, and we, 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 we have planted both with a seed drill, you know, as we scale up and we've also just, you know, broadcast the hemp and, um, you know, we've been planting these varieties that we got, you know, X 59 and Futura 75. That's been our favorite so far. Uh, Fibron, you know, and I noticed all these varieties are, are Italian and Spanish, right? I mean, you wouldn't know that necessarily the X 59s from Canada, 
you know, it's because, you know, we don't have any varieties left in this country, although there's feral varieties. And this last year we did a, a, a project with the University of Minnesota where there are feral varieties from my treaty territory that came in and, and we have collected some. So, you know, we're hoping to, de to, to develop varieties that are really suited for our region, which is what farmers do, right? And, and for the tribes in our area and, and for different things. So then I, uh, I actually purchased a seed collection from Russia and it has, uh, it comes from, um, you know, researchers that were at the, I forget I said Vakalov, the big research center with the Russian seeds that they just, they're dispersing and the Russians can their hemp, their, their cannabis program. And so, uh, but you know, my interest is, is the 71 varieties that were grown in Russia until it was criminalized. Um, well, actually, I don't know if it was criminalized in Russia, but the market was was dried up by by the French in a, in a seedy deal in the 1940s. Not to go too tra transcendental, but anyway, if you're me and you live in the north, you're looking Russia. You know what I'm saying? So fun to grow things from. You know, wow, how cool is it that you could grow all these things from Spain? But maybe you want to try the seeds from the north, like the Ukraine. Romanians have good hemp, so we've been growing, and I'm intending to grow those varieties out. And, and we want to create something like seed savers, you know, because it's, it's these seed stock and, and really, you know, I could try to hoard it, but that's not going to be very revolutionary, is it? You know, we aren't going to change the world if I hoard all the seeds and I charge you a gazillion dollars for the seeds. So what I'm really interested in is, is the adaptation and some of those varieties, like in the field studies of them, they're like the birds eat them, you know, so those are the ones you need for bird seed, right? And some of them grow 10 feet tall without any prompting. That's the ones you need for, for long fiber, right? I mean, it's super interesting to watch this, right? I mean, I'm, I'm talking to the converted, but so I've been growing in these fields on the reservation. I've been kind of, what I would say, I'd be uh, sharecropping, getting like different fields, growing in different fields and getting people this, I know this is the story of every farmer, like, can I grow in your field this year? <laughs> right, isn't this everybody's story? It's like, can, can I just borrow a little corner? You know, and so I, I uh, it's such a, you know, giant mess with the with the seeds and the and the uh, criminalization and so my tribe doesn't even have a hemp lot rule so i have a federal permit and a state permit you know and then everything is super expensive but you know i'm committed and uh fortunately i have some uh very you know winona's hemp has individual supporters and anishinaabe agriculture has some foundation support and individual donors that's how we're doing it because uh, somebody's got to do it uh we let it grow it and and then you know in august or early september you can you can harvest it and uh you know before the seeds is what they say for a lot of the textile varieties but since we're also growing for seeds we wait and now we're we're just looking i've just been looking for like as i gear up for combine which combines that are appropriate for the scale and then you know i don't think we're going to horse draw our combine but i'm probably using the horses for a lot of my smaller fields and um you know, it's just, it's just a super interesting time. And I'm really excited about spring. Do you, do you get that from this conversation? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> have you, have you been able to uh, process down any of your, your long fiber varieties to actually make fibers? Well, that's the interesting thing. The Navajos, those, those are, those are long fibers. Okay. The only people I've actually seen turn it into something cool in North America is the Navajo nation, you know, and the Diné weavers. And I was like, oh, go figure, you know, of course they could do that. Sure. Huh? Ancient wisdom, you know. Yeah, well, and they, they know how to weave, you know, but they, they, they were at the hemp conference and like, can we have some of that hemp to take home? I was like, sure, you know, cause we're all trying to learn together, right? But then we sent our stuff down to these guys called Renaissance Fiber down in, in Virginia. And the problem with this is, is that you end up with somebody starts and then they change corporate ownership and move their factory. This has happened to me about six times. And now apparently our fiber has been well decorticated the equipment broke down. I understand the last time they went down there, and, you know, so it's really hard to buy equipment that breaks down while you're watching it. Did yeah. I say that to you clearly? Does everybody yeah. understand that that puzzle? I was like, wow, that's great. Can can we buy that? Wait, wait, wait. It doesn't work. Okay, let's fix that one. Okay, so I'm waiting for the smart white guys to fix some equipment so we can use it. I'm not mechanical, and um, then I understand like ag formation has some. So now I'm like reviewing in this last year in the pandemic with the bust in the cannabis industry from can't smoke the whole thing to maybe we should move into fiber, more people are getting in. 
but we need them to figure out how to get the fiber out of the field. And then the other thing is you, you got to take it out of the field and it'll mess up your equipment because it's strong as heck. You'll wind up around all your sickle mowers and everything, right? And then after you get it out, you got to decorticate it in something that cleans it enough that separates out the fiber from the herd because everybody wants it separated out. And so we've got that basically, but then for textiles, like if I was going to make this shirt here, it got to be degummed because it has this stuff called pectin in it, or it's pectin lignin, which is basically a pectin. And that is usually pretty caustic. And I've looked at all these technologies. Now the Navajos could regum, degum, but you know, half this stuff is like super toxic. And so what we need to do, and I'm kind of pleading with y'all, be a brain trust for us. You know, like let's all work together because you know, the future should not be controlled by corporations. And if we're gonna get the hemp economy going, we're really gonna need to figure out the technology. And um, so I'm praying, I'm working on it, and then I'm looking out to see who's doing anything, and I may be heading over to Belgium soon. Now, you know, if the pandemic subsides, I'm going to go snooping around in Belgium and, yeah, see, somebody had something about our seeds. Isn't that interesting with these seeds? So I got them through some kind of, you know, interesting, interesting story, but I feel like the Russian seeds, I'm going to give them a try. What just the tying back into that? What what is your actual hardiness zone? What what are you what are you at? I don't know. That's like a question you're asking me. Fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was I mean say like five, I'm in northern five. Minnesota. Yeah, it's right? cold. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, like, where are you guys? We're seven, six, seven. Like in the so like the coldest we get was like we did last week was we might get to seven degrees Fahrenheit. Well, Not we were point. a strong minus twenty five and. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> yeah, not for that, not for the wimps, you know, you got to yeah. be tough to live in Minnesota year round. Uh, but, you know, so it, it is it is that. But there's also these questions like I field redded and and this is what I noticed. You cut that hemp down. But now that I'm not fighting the pipeline and don't have to be out there trying to get myself arrested all the time, I can spend more time with my hemp. Let us pray, you know, that you know, we'll keep fighting. I mean, no, there's another thousand people to go stand up for these projects besides me so I can get to my hemp. But anyway, so we go there. And uh, you cut the hemp and you leave it in the field and then you flip it. And the thing about the fraud, see, this is not Colorado. Everybody want to give me a gazillion, a gazillion pieces of advice, but they're from Colorado. I was like, how interesting, Colorado. You know, us gets wet. Colorado doesn't get wet, gets frozen. And that process busts up the molecules. So I actually believe that northern hemp varieties might have a better shot at degumming themselves through mother nature rather than all crazy. So that's like my this year project is to figure out how to get this hemp degummed in the field. And I'm just gonna stick on it and I'm putting it out there. Um, is that redding process similar to what would have to be done with, with flax then? It's, it's that kind of field Well, this is the question. If anybody's got the flax thing, it is very similar. And, and you know, in Belgium, they make the best canvas with flax, but in, in North Dakota, they burn fields of flax. You know, I mean, American agriculture is backwards as heck. You know, it's just backwards as heck. And now someone said the seeds from the Russian collection are from all the world. No, this collection of Russian seeds is only from Russia. It was collected from Central Russia, Southern Russia, Northern Russia, you know, and because uh, I, I have the points of the origins of them. But, you know, it's super interesting in this time to, you know, in the biodiversity, you don't want to grow one kind of hemp for the same reasons you want to grow one kind of potato. And also because you got different uses for them, right? You know, some you're going to make into rope, long fiber rope. That's only hanging ropes. Hanging ropes were actually required to be hemp, right? Isn't that crazy, horrible thing? <laughs> well, yeah. theater, theater ropes. I also come from a theater background. Old, old theaters, uh, you know, growing up uh, at the uh, convention hall in Asbury Park, all those old stage ropings and all the the ship ropings were all hemp because it's right. strong. It's it's the top, you know, weight per not PSI. PSI would be a, what would you call it? tensile strength or something? Yeah, um, tensile strength is very good. Yeah, yeah. And so I see have, you know, my friend Jim Riddle. I mean, I think he knows about this, like the Winona, Minnesota hemp stuff. And you know, I mean, there's a huge, you know, there's a huge interest, but it's stimmied by different things, especially this trying to figure out the technology because it's a, you know, I mean. So I'm committed to it, but I think also, and everyone on this call knows like these issues of, if you go into something because you think you're going to make a million bucks, that's a bad way to start. And that's what people have done with cannabis. 
treat it like, you know, treat that plant like they're going to make a billion off of her. And what we know is, is that you got to treat the plant with respect. And, and since we actually don't know much, you better learn from the plant. So, you know, start slow, be respectful and, and get a bunch of friends, right? You know, you need a lot of friends to do this. So, yeah. Um, so this is a, a, a seeds moral question, perhaps. Um, and I think you've kind of already answered it because you're talking about sourcing uh, seeds from uh, Russia, totally different continent in this sense. Uh, so well, someone's brought up, um, they're of a European lineage and they are uh, valuing connecting with their ancestors as, as we all should. Um, and, but they want to know, let's see, how can I word this best? For a young farmer of European ancestry, would you recommend planting varieties from my own lineage or those indigenous to this land? Do I have the right to grow native American heritage varieties? Yeah, I mean, I think you have the right. I get kind of, you know, it's, I think that there's this problem of you do it for yourself or you go sell Hopi corn at your farm stand. I think Hopi should sell Hopi corn. You know, I mean, that's kind of a little of my problem with the commercializing. But, you know, I mean, Indian people are totally appropriated and commercialized. I mean, the Washington Redskins to the Hopi corn and the Pontiac vehicle, you know, that's like the gig, you know, stick an Indian on the label and sell it for more, you know. But, you know, we're talking about plants and seeds and a lot of the, the, the good allies have been people who've grown these out with us, you know, and so grow whatever, you know, be happy and grow good food. I'm not going to tell you you can't grow indigenous seeds, just don't, you know, it, it makes me kind of sad, like the Gete Okosaman seeds that are in the Baker seed catalog, I wouldn't sell them the seeds. I said, I give them away, you know, and then they got someone to sell them and now they sell them, you know, but to me, it's this, you know, everybody here knows this conundrum of, you know, selling so you can cover your butt, you know, as a farmer. And then also like, you know, uh, like in my case, I'm, I'm more in the, in the seed commons strategy because in the hemp world, like I want to take care of these varieties, but I, we plan to work with tribes in our region to grow them all because we all need to figure out how to make insulation out of hemp, you know, and, and at, at you know, the Yankton reservation, they have seeds that, you know, are hemp that were feral on the Missouri River that are 14 feet tall, you know, so they should figure out what they, what, obviously it grows well, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we should yeah. figure out what seeds would be good for what varieties, like, you know, I mean, what varieties would be good for what, you know, things that are, they're doing in their market. I just think it's super interesting. And, and we are actually, I am, we are hiring an administrative director for Anishinaabe Agriculture. I prefer native, but you don't gotta be native, but you gotta be smart and hardworking. I'm just saying that. And we are looking for more people that wanna like share on this information on the hemp commons, you know, because uh, we could all be super secret, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty good detective and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out the information here and man, you know, we, sh we should share, you know? Yeah, if you, if you close your doors, doors are closed to you. So it, you just gotta open up and share, absolutely. Yeah. And the hemp fiber mills in Minnesota, you know, mothballed, dismantled. This is a mystery that I'm trying to, you know, we're trying to solve. And, you know, anybody else want to tackle the mystery? There's a couple of people kind of interested in that, you know, and, and, you know, if I could find like the exact layout and the equipment that was in a hemp fiber mill, you know, you know, the hemp stone and the boiling things. I mean, there was these like big hemp stones that they used to roll around the hemp on. And I mean, I don't know, I would have, uh, you know, right now, you know, I would really have liked to see one of those mills because there's this intersection between the slavery labor in hemp and cotton and the early mechanization, you know, um, and that's kind of, I'm interested in this intermediate technology is what I'm really interested in, you know, just a little bit left of the Amish. That's kind of my technology scale. You know, what can you do without a lot of fossil fuels and toxins? What is, you know, the appropriate technology for the size? How big should it be a mill? you know, uh, you know, 5,000, you know, serving 10,000 acres. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like these yeah. questions of scaling and economy are questions that we're all looking at as farmers. And it, hemp is a brand new economy. Can, the cannabis economy is a brand new economy. Yeah. And we all know that. And so that, you know, what we want is equity in the economy, like native people like myself, we, we don't want to be in the back seat of this one because we've had, we're done, you know? So we want to work together, but also at the same time, and, and, you know, from all the way from recreational 
to this. You know, we want to be at the table. We don't want to be on the menu, you know, but it represents an entirely new economy. I mean, I just, I was in Maine one time, like I don't travel anymore, most of us don't, but I saw that they Maine legalized cannabis and I see that everything is grown and manufactured in Maine, you know? I mean, to me, that whole idea of how you build a local economy with that chain of custody, so good, you know? So we are nearing our, our end of our conversation here. And, you know, this goes for the rest of all of our talks um, from Jim earlier and the rest of the ones we'll have in the next two days. If anyone has more questions or they want to in, engage, uh, either shoot us, NOFA uh, email, we'll help connect you to get your questions over to our speakers. Or again, just do your best to enter stuff into the chat and we will field as much as we can. Um, Winona, thank you again so much, incredibly. Um, I hope we get to talk to you more. And, and if you need uh, to bounce ideas, we're, we're open for you too, so. Um, no, I'm, putting my, to I'm putting my email up there at the hemp, okay? And if fantastic. anybody's got any cool hemp ideas or collaborations, you know, send it out there. Um, you know, uh, like I said, we need friends. We all do. Anyway, you guys are awesome. Thanks for, for letting me come over here and be all excited about hemp with you. <laughs> thanks for coming. Thank, yeah, it's thanks. amazing. Thanks, thanks for your yeah, work. Be good. All right. Um, so next up, we have a, actually, I, Scott, it's going to be Scott's turn. I'm trying to, I take over too much. He's um, a talker. I'm a talker. He's just automatic. I'm he automatic. just goes. Um, um, Nagisa, did you have something that you wanted to say or should we just keep? I wanted arguing? Jim to say hi to Winona, but that's oh, all. Oh, man. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So. So do we have, is, Garrett, are you nearby? I, I or? Yeah, I think Garrett is here, but I think we should just take give everyone the five minute break. All yeah. right. Well, let's let's that sounds good. Let's uh, let's take five minutes and stretch the legs, and uh, we'll be back to hear from Garrett Grady Lovelace. Great. <laughs> 